Well, it is my happy privilege to introduce our guest speaker for today. Uh, he's a wonderful man of God, a husband, a father, a pastor, an encourager, um, and he is just enjoying being here with us. He said that many times, so I'm just really excited to be able to introduce Pastor Terrence, a good friend. Come on up and share God's word with us. Let's encourage him as he comes. God bless you, sir. Amen. It's good to see everyone this morning. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to stand with me and join hands with the person next to you. Can I tell you something while you're doing that? You may not know this, but, but I've got a kind of a secret to tell you. That person whose hand you're holding is probably one of the greatest miracles you've ever seen in your life. See, the truth is, you don't know their whole story. You're not quite aware where God has brought them from. You're not quite aware. You see them Sunday morning, sometimes during, week, during the week in services and gatherings, but you don't know their whole story. And their whole story is a story of, yes, God's grace. But God's grace does two things. God's grace forgives us, but it also empowers us forgives us so that we can move on, and it empowers us to move on. And so you are holding the hand of one of the greatest miracles you have ever seen in your life, and that is a privilege. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Your loving kindness is better than life, so our lips will give you praise. You are the king eternal. You are mortal. You are invisible. You are the only wise God. Today, we thank you for the privilege of being your children, heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Father, thank you for the opportunity to fellowship here at Cornerstone with the people of God. And we ask now that your Holy Spirit will begin to unlock in a new dimension understanding and wisdom into our hearts because we honestly want to carry out your eternal purposes. We want to live out your mandate. We one day want to hear you say, well done. And so, Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we receive the revelation of your truth into our hearts, and may it change us forever. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a joy to be able to come and share the word of the Lord with you, and I trust that you came expecting I've always learned that the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. And because we serve such a big God, we ought to expect big. <laughs> Consider this, we are children of a God who upholds the entire universe by the word of his power. And so we will take our time this morning, and I trust, you know, we won't, I won't keep you long. But consider that, that in the beginning, God said, and what he said has not ceased. You and I are not just a part of a religious organization. You and I are part of something far bigger and far greater. And because our God is who he is, you and I ought to begin to understand who we are in him. And so I want to talk to you today, and I want to stay, I, 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 want to, I want to craft what I'll share with you today within the context of what Pastor Joe has been sharing with you, and I appreciate your pastor so much. I love these gentlemen, and I understand the shiftings and the challenges that we go through in ministries, and oftentimes the, the, the changing of seasons. But I want you to know something about seasons. Seasons come to close out an era and cause you to enter into a new one. Seasons are times of shifting. And so seasons come and every, everything changes. And the only constant in life really is change. Change will always happen. But you and I can either, we can either complain about change 
or just like it's, it's just like a wave. You, you, you're really not, you really don't determine what waves come. Waves are not yours to determine. But you can learn how to surf. <laughs> and if you learn how to surf, whatever the wave is, you just surf through it. And so I want to encourage you this morning to be an encouragement for the journey of Cornerstone and for where you are in life and, 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 and what God is doing in this house. Remember this always, the church is his, not yours. I know that's a challenging thing to, that's a challenging thing to grapple with oftentimes because as men, as humans, because of the mandate of heaven, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, because of the mandate of heaven, we have the power of stewardship and really levels of control. But there are some things we don't control. The church is his. Jesus says uh, at the revelation of who he was, he says, upon this rock, this revelation, I will build my church. I will build my church. And so he builds and we steward with him in the building of his church. But you and I are going to find out even more that the church is not the end game. We'll find out that the church exists for a reason beyond itself. And so let's look at a couple of things today, and I'm going to try to tie our message in. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the priority of the kingdom. The priority of the kingdom. In my time in uh, Bible school, it was quite interesting. We did tremendous studies on a lot of things. We did eschatology, and we learned how to lay out sermons, and we learned all some theological uh, truths. We did systematic theology. But yet we found out that after I came through it, there was never a class on what Jesus taught on the most. And what Jesus taught on the most was his kingdom. But yet there was no class on the kingdom of God. We did a lot of study, years of study. We graduated. Graduated with no classes on what Jesus taught on the most. And so let's look at it this morning. And look at the person next to you and say, let's buckle up a little bit. Let's look, let's, let's start off and let's look at Luke chapter 11. Now, I don't know if you normally have scriptures up. I'm in the New King James in the event that you do. By the way, at this stage in my life, I need some help. This is almost 33 years of marriage coming up next weekend three children. <laughs> Just need, some, need some help reading. We're going to look at Luke chapter 11. And we're going to look from verse number one. And there's going to be a number of scriptures that we look at this morning. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as for, we, uh, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It was quite interesting that the disciples had identified that Jesus oftentimes spent time in prayer. As a matter of fact, Jesus would spend time in prayer probably more than anything else, which was really the secret of, of his operating in power and, and, and the miracle signs, wonders, and the teachings that they saw. And so this record of the disciples asking Jesus a question is only one of the only times it's recorded that they asked him to teach them something. And they didn't ask for him to teach them anything else but to pray because they must have known, identifying Jesus' life, that prayer was vital to how he functioned. That, Lord, teach us to pray. And many of us know this as the Lord's Prayer, also recorded in Matthew chapter 6. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And really, it's our prayer. It's really not the Lord's Prayer. He, he, it's our prayer. And he said, because they said, teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, pray like this. But the theme of his prayer becomes vitally important. 
How many of you, and I know this is a rhetorical question, it's going to sound real, real crazy. How many of you work? <laughs> and all of you looking like you're saying, this guy up there, like, who is he? How many of you work? How many of you work on a job? How many of you work for a company? How many of you are self, you, you and your own business? Now, now I, I do like to interact, and most, many times at our church, I just remind them that Sunday mornings is a big group session. And so we talk to each other. And so I hope you're okay with that because the Bible tells us we're to exhort one another. And so I want to ask you this. How many of you know the vision statements of your organizations? Someone said they read it. I read it. I read it. I'm not quite sure what it is. Why, why are vision statements important? Why do we have them? Give direction. Motivation, okay, and all of those things. Vision statements are important because they help to galvanize all of the efforts that we have, all of the different parts of what we do towards a common goal. So if you don't know the vision of, let's say the organization you work for, if you don't know what the vision is, then why do you show up? I said, I need to make some money. <laughs> Got to pay some bills. Got to, just trying to have a life. <laughs> but the truth, of the, matter, the truth of the matter is, if you go to a place and work and they have a vision statement that drives what it is they do and you don't know what it is, then you cannot truly say that you are living within the context of what the organization is trying to accomplish. So you show up for you and not the organization. Pretty fair to say? God, then, is a God of design, plan, and objectivity. He does nothing without a purpose. Nothing. Now, we can begin, we live our lives oftentimes very haphazardly. And I think, you know, we try to live, we try to live purposeful. But because God is a God of purpose then it becomes important for us to understand as his body, his church, it becomes important for us to understand why we exist because we could actually think we own the church. We, make, we get to make some decisions, but the decisions must be within the context of what the vision of the church is, and the vision of the church is not something we created. The one who heads the church created the vision. And so it becomes important for us, I heard it mentioned earlier, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And so many of us have tremendous pictures of missions work, which is what you're involved in, and we're all involved in missions work. Go and make disciples of all nations, all nations. It's very, very interesting that the target of discipleship is nations. Now, we do disciple people. But the mandate that Christ gave us was to disciple nations. Look at your name and say, don't get too nervous. We're on our way. And so, understanding the context of discipleship, understanding the context of going into all the world and making disciples of all nations then becomes vitally important because it is what the one who has given the vision determined. And so what we do and how we function becomes vitally important to him. That's why at the end of this life, you and I will stand before the one who gave us the mandate. And he will judge us based on what he has decreed, not what we felt like in the moment. You ever had, you ever had one of those meetings that you go to and you're trying to get something accomplished within your organization or so on and so forth, and you have someone who says something like, well, I feel to myself that. You ever had one of those? Well, I feel to myself that it should be, and I feel to myself, and I feel to myself, and I feel to myself, and I feel to myself that it should be, and I feel to myself. And oftentimes, the feeling that they have to themselves has nothing to do with what the organization is trying to accomplish. One of the things I appreciate about listening to the CEO of Apple, he said, we turn down thousands of good ideas every week because those good ideas are not always in line with what we are trying to accomplish. Tell you, look at your neighbor and say, sometimes you've got to turn down a good idea. 
And sometimes it hurts people's feelings when you don't follow up on what they are so passionate about, but it's really not a part of what you're doing at the time. And so understanding the whole reason why you and I are here this morning, it is to worship God. It is. But what does that really mean? So we give up ourselves every weekend. Some, I, I was talking to Dr. Laura as I came in, and she's my chiropractor. She helps straighten me out when my back is. She helps straighten me out when, when parts of my anatomy are doing things to my back. <laughs> and she helps straighten me out. And, so, and she told me that she was here since 8 o'clock this morning, <laughs> setting up and, and doing her part. And it becomes vitally important that you and I are able to have an understanding of not what we do and how we do it, but why we do it. Because the why is what drives the what and the how. It's why we do what we do. When God deals with us, he will deal with us based on the why first before the what. Once you have the why straight, and so whenever you want to know why you're doing a thing, you ask why until you can't ask why anymore. Until you get down to the original intent of what you are doing and how you are doing it. And so we're going to look at several scriptures this morning. You know Matthew chapter, three verse, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Let's turn to it. And everyone is familiar with this, but seek first, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Many of us seek righteousness, but it gives us two objects to seek there, or, or, or two focuses of our, of our seeking. Seek first. Number one, the kingdom of God and then his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Jesus gives, this, Jesus gives this discourse when they are asking him about life and that they've given up so much to follow him and, and they've given up house, they've given up family and so on and so forth. And so he begins to tell them not to worry and, and, and don't let worry overwhelm you. God knows the things that you stand in need of in terms of natural needs, clothing, food, and, 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 and uh, uh, shelter. But he said, those things are the priority of the Gentiles. And Gentiles, basically, when he said that, he said, those without the covenants of God. And so their priority, the rest of the world, their priority is to take care of the body first. Because that's what we see in front of us. And so we're concerned about housing. It's a very legitimate concern. We're concerned about clothing. Very legitimate concern. We're concerned about money. Very legitimate concerns. And we're concerned about all of those things, but Jesus said, don't make that the priority of what you seek. Very interesting. He said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, those things will be an addition to you. Hello? How many of you have ever shifted into that kind of addition? Mm-hmm. Because for us, those things, are, we oftentimes make them primary. We work for the primary felt needs. Need food, need... How many of you understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs? It starts off with felt needs first, and then you go to significance. God does it the other way around. Learn your significance, it'll take care of the self-needs. So when... when because he says, is, watch this, is not life more than clothing? That's pretty, you know, that's pretty, that's something for Jesus to throw out there. Is not life more than clothing? Is not life more than food? In other words, the value of human life is not based on the body. The value of human life is, is based on the fact that mankind in the beginning was created in the image and likeness of God. And that's what makes him valuable. Now, one of the things that you and I will understand about God is that the word says God's, God's word will not return to him void. 
but it will accomplish everything that he sent it to do. And so when God declares a word in the earth, when he declares an intended purpose, that intended purpose becomes law. That is it. So in Genesis chapter 1, as we begin to understand the context of our mandate to disciple nations, we understand then that God's original intent, his original intent is declared in, Math, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. This is God's vision statement for man. Let us make man. I'll do my best God voice. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. We're fashioned like God. We have, we have, uh, we have will. We, we, the way we function, we are, we are moral beings. The way we function, we are able to choose. We are able to make decisions. We are able to process information. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at the person next to you and said, oh my gosh, you are made up well. Oh, man. I mean, you are, so, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, you got to take care of it, but I'm just saying, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. The most powerful truth that you and I are going to learn around God's vision statement for man is in the two words, and let them have dominion. If you go to Psalms chapter 8, Around verses 4 to 6, you'll find the psalmist asks the question, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit, for you've made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. He said, You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. And so you've crowned him with glory and honor. And then the description of that glory and honor is in the next verse. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. Do you know that the problems that are happening in the world, and they are varied indeed all around the world, from wars to rumors of wars to, uh, to hunger to starvation, do you know that all of those problems exist at the hands of man? Oftentimes, especially when you have those who may be atheistic cynics, who will say, if God really does exist, and if God really is a God of love, then why is this happening, and why is that happening, and why is the other thing happening? I don't understand. If God was a God of love, if God is all powerful, and if God is all of that, why is this like this, and why, is, why are we starving, and why are nations going through what they go through? And they are going through what they go through simply because God had a caveat in his vision statement. Mankind asks, where is God? God says, I'm where I always was. The question is, where are you? <laughs> How many of you have ever said things like somebody said, you know, man, I found the Lord. I, I found the Lord. How many of you know he wasn't lost? <laughs> <laughs> but you found, you found, no, no, he found you. As a matter of fact, he created, sir, you didn't even know it. You didn't, while you were not even looking for him, he was crafting circumstances around your life that one day you would hear a message that would allow you to respond. And you were not really looking for him, but he was looking for you. He's the hound of heaven. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And he will track you down until he gets your attention. He's not lost. So all of those challenges that we experience in the world is not at the hands of God. God is not the problem. The problem is man. Our little nation, our little island, this little place called Bermuda, and all of the things that we are challenged with, how many of you know that God didn't start those problems? He did. Those are things that are done by man. Now, let them have dominion over all the earth. Fish of the sea, birds of the air, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. So God made them. He made them male and female. I don't need to teach that. We don't have to argue that. He made them male and female for a purpose. They have a purpose. Now, 
Now, here's what, here's what the world does, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. God creates everything with a natural fit, but when men doesn't like it, he tries to force the fit. And you have to be careful because you can force a fit for so long that after a while a force fit will feel like a natural fit. And so God said he made the male and female, and then he said, have dominion over the earth over the fish of the sea. He said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, fill the earth, subdue it. Who has that responsibility? Man. And so he wired us with the capacity to run a planet. Ooh. Think about it for a minute. He created man with the capacity that's why our children ought to be the best scientists. They ought to be the best in technology. And I'm talking about the people of God because they understand the eternal purposes of God. They don't do it just to make money. They do it as a discovery of the divine grace and majesty and beauty of God. And so he gave them dominion. Psalms 115, I think it's around verse 16, it says, The heavens, even the heavens belong to God, but the earth he's given to the sons of man. Wow. So therefore, if we look at the mandate to disciple nations, the discipling of nations is not outside of the scope of God's original intent. Because when mankind, what we call the fall, we have to understand what he fell from. And so when mankind disobeyed and declared his independence from God, what he lost was his connectivity with God, which is what causes his value. And so what he lost on that day was legitimate dominion. Legitimate dominion. Because God sets the parameters for what that dominion looks like. Are you following me? So then, Jesus makes the statement, you know what it is, Genesis 3.15. He tells the serpent, which is, you know, Satan taking on the form of a serpent. And did you ever find it interesting that Eve talked to the serpent and wasn't surprised? You ever, you ever? Okay, it's another teaching. She wasn't shocked that the serpent was talking. I mean, you thought she would have said, huh? What was it like then? She talks to the serpent, and they're dialoguing. And the serpent does what I call a jujitsu move. Watch this. He taps into a legitimate desire, but then shifts the way to get it. God said that man was created in his image and likeness. So the serpent came and said, well, actually, he just showed up. <laughs> and began this conversation, what did God say or what are you doing? And Eve said, you know, well, you know, God said. And she repeated what God said. And then he said, is that right? And then he starts. He knows <laughs> that if you eat off of the fruit of that tree, you're not going to die. Come on, duh. He knows that in the day that you eat of it, you'll be like God's. Now here, legitimate desire, but shifted the mode to get it. And, and caused them, the Bible says Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. Eve ate. You ever notice, men, that when Eve ate, nothing happened. But when Adam ate, Throwing this caveat, she should have been covered by him. When God came down after this all happened, he said, he didn't say, Adam and Eve, where are you? He said, Adam, front and center. <laughs> and then Adam did what we have learned to do. Adam, what's, what's going on? You, you've never hidden from, you've never... 
This is our place where we communicate. You've never hidden from me. While I was naked and ashamed. He said, who told you you were naked? Where would you get that from? Did you? Okay, look, what happened, right? Hey, look, I was just, I was minding my own business. I was, I was trying to do what you want, call me. To, and then, like, Eve called me and, like, you know, she's my girl, you know. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> Eve, you took her out of, remember, you put me to sleep and you took that sister out of there. And, you know, she's fine and she looks good. And, oh, my God. And she called me and she was like. <laughs> and, and so he shifts the blame. Because it's a challenging thing to be accountable. So it shifts the blame. And you know how that goes. And it goes all the way down to the serpent. Until God starts with the serpent and says, here's what's going to happen. But he says in Genesis 3.15, but let me tell you what I'm going to do. And grace steps in and gives them a future focus and says, the day is coming where the seed of the woman will bruise your authority, your head, even though you'll bruise his heel. Satan knew that and tracked humanity down for centuries and millennium looking for the seed. Well, can I tell you just to make the long story short, the seed was Christ. And Christ came to, watch this, restore the original vision. Salvation is a work of restoration, not an addendum to the plan. Salvation then is a work of restoring what God's original intent was. And so Jesus comes, the Bible calls him many things. He's Abraham's seed. He's what God spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 verses 18 when he said after Abraham had obeyed, he said, because you have obeyed my voice, in blessing I will bless you, and in your seed, watch this, in your seed, all of the nations shall be blessed. In your seed, all of the nations shall be blessed. In your seed, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And when he spoke that, he was not talking about Isaac. Paul gets the revelation after spending time with the Holy Spirit. And he said in Galatians chapter 3, he said when God spoke to Abraham, he preached the gospel to Abraham, when he told Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And he did not say seeds as in many, but seed as in one. And Paul said, and that seed was Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was the promise? The promise was that in that seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now you have to understand that by the mandate because he said, go into all the world and disciple because his original intent was for all the, to be blessed by the seed. Not just go to church. You as a child of God has a mandate waiting for you in the world that many of you still have to show up for. And so, the mandate of God on humanity, and tell your neighbor, say, it's all in the book. And I, what I appreciate about Pastor Joe, he was sharing with me about the necessity and the importance here in this house of, of having fidelity to Scripture. So that we're not just throwing things out there and you hear it and say, oh, that sounds real nice. In the beginning, God made a decree and made a declaration. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. Sin caused him to lose his lo legitimate rule in the earth. How many of you know that the word dominion is a kingdom term? Because God was establishing from out of his kingdom in heaven. Oh my gosh, I mean, God is big. Listen to me, saints of God. He's huge. I mean, like, I mean, God is like bodacious big. You, God is vast. God is large. No, when I say large, I mean like, I'm talking covering the moon and the stars. They all answer to him. 
No, no, he's not a religious icon that we craft in our image. Oh, no, 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 no. What you know about God is not all that there is to know about God. You know, we have, we have genres of Christianity. <laughs> we have genres of Christianity, and, and this is just observation, not a criticism. We have genres of, uh, because I was, raised, I was raised Pentecostal. I bet you couldn't tell, but... I was raised Pentecostal. You know, we were the noisy bunch. <laughs> Come on, man. You know it. You know, this folk talking about all that. We were the noisy bunch. But it came with a perspective that anybody that was not Pentecostal didn't really have the real thing. So we would judge others. I'm just confessing. And so if you were brethren, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It was encoded within the genre of Pentecostalism that, you know, the brethren or the AMEs, the Methodists, they don't quite have it the way we have it. And then along came charismatic. Oh. It just... <laughs> My point is this. Each one of the genres has a legitimate perspective that was a part of the revelation that they thought was the whole thing. And so they built their genre on a part, trying to measure out within the context of their genre how God is. Tell your neighbor, say, he's bigger than your genre. <laughs> no, no, say, like, he's much bigger than your genre. <laughs> he's much bigger than your genre of Christianity, your idea, your concept. He rules the universe. As a matter of fact, just in case you didn't know, Satan is on a leash. God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When Satan acts for Job, you know the whole conversation with Job? He said, yeah, go after Job, but here's the criteria. And Satan could not, even now, he could not violate. God said, you can go after him, you can touch his body and all of that, but you can have his soul. That's the limit. And Satan couldn't go out and say, well, I'm just going to violate your limit. He said, okay, because even Satan is on a leash. Oh, God. And so God is huge. Pastor Joe, he is huge. He is bigger than the problem you are experiencing right now. He's bigger. He's bigger than the challenge that you are facing right now. He is bigger bigger and when you learn to focus let me tell you what happens sometimes if God was for instance the size of this room let's just trying to analyze that and this is your problem our tendency and our challenge is around focus because when we have a problem that this big within the context of the size of God this is what we do we focus on the problem so all we can see is the and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow because, and we don't know if our life is going to turn because this small thing in comparison to the largeness of God has our attention. But when you magnify the Lord, the psalmist knew what he talked about when he said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. When you magnify God, you magnify God and make him bigger than your little problem. And whatever it is you might be facing right now, know that God is so much bigger. God knows your future like you know your yesterday. Oh, don't play with me. God is so big. As a matter of fact, he said, I wrote the book about your life before you got here. The book of Psalms. He tells us, no, lets us know, Psalms 139. He talks about being fearfully and wonderfully made. And he said, all the days of our lives were written in his book before we even lived one of them. He wrote them. As a matter of fact, the fact that you are here, can I help you? The fact that you are here is evidence that something was written about you. And you've got to find out the script. You've got to find out what he wrote. You've got to find out your part in the eternal purpose of God so that you can live on purpose. And prayer has to have a purpose focus. Because prayer brings us into agreement with God 
to establish his kingdom on the earth. I don't pray to God for God to do what I wanted to do. That would mean I'm in charge. And he's not created in my image. I'm created in his. When we pray then, we pray so that we can hear what his plan is. Not for him to get on board with ours. Unless our, I, I know you're in control. Listen, listen, I know you run the universe. I know, I know, I know. Job had the same question. I'm a good man. I'm a righteous man. I haven't done bad. Like, why is all of this happening to me? Why? Why is all of this happening? Why? You know Job's challenge. And God, you know, Job, Job answers. It says, if, if only I can get an audience with God. If I could just have a little talk with God and, and tell him all about my troubles. He'll hear your fainted cry. Answer by and by. Feel a little prayer will turn and no, no, Okay, no, sir. <laughs> so he asks God. So God finally, around chapter 38, he calls Job. He responds. And he says, Job, brace up. Because I'm going to ask you a question. And if you can answer me, I'll answer you. Do you know that the reason why you are breathing right now is because he permitted it? I know you're in control of everything. I know. But do you not know that the minute he says, it's up? It's up. And you have this space of time to accomplish his purposes that required you to be on this planet. Prayer then allows us to, on a corporate level and on an individual level, connect with the eternal purposes of God, whether it be for this congregation or whether it be for you individually, whether it be for your family, whether it be for the job that you have. Prayer allows us to connect with him to discover what he purposed and then to align our lives, righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness is simply right alignment. Can I share with you that righteousness in Scripture is really not a religious word? As a matter of fact, the word translated church, that's translated in the Greek, translated church, is not a religious term. It's ecclesia. Ecclesia was a term that was created by the Greeks as they were fashioning their forms of government, and they had this body called the ecclesia. Rome ad adopted it. It, when, when Rome conquered Greece, then Rome adopted this form of government where citizens who qualified to run, sorry, who qualified would run cities and, and they would be very responsible in the management of cities. They called them the ecclesia. So you have to understand when Jesus said that, when Peter said, you are Christ, the son of the living God, he said, upon this rock I will build my ecclesia. He said it for a reason. Upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, and the next term helps us to understand the context of the ecclesia. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against them, and I will give them, I will give them, I will give them, and let them have. I will give them the keys of the kingdom. The purpose of the church then is to manifest the kingdom of God, not just to have church. Woo, boy. It's wonderful that you have every, the, so many nations because that's the kingdom of God. The first covenant was, could not cover the scope of what God was going to do. It just helped man until the fullness came. The first covenant wouldn't have had all of the nations of the world because you had to be Jew. His purpose from the beginning, when he told Abraham in Genesis chapter uh, 12, he said, in blessing, I'm going to bless you, and in you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Nations has always been God's plan, always been his plan. And so Christ now becomes that seed that God used. God birthed him in the earth. For unto us a child is born, body. For unto us a son is given, eternal. 
He was the God-man. And the reason why he came the way that he did, he had to come as the God-man because his purpose in coming was to restore man. So he had to have enough of God in him to carry the weight of the mandate to come and reconcile man because his purpose was to reconcile man. God didn't come, J Jesus didn't come to fix God. He came to fix man. Oh boy. Turn to your neighbor and say, I believe your life is just getting ready to take off unlike you've ever seen before. Now tell your neighbor, say, we talk to each other. We exhort one another. Tell them, say, your life is about ready to take off. Your life is about to take off because, because God is helping us to live on purpose. Look at your neighbor and just ask them, say, why did you wake up this morning? Like, really, why did you wake up? Not the fact that you woke up. That's the what. <laughs> Not the fact that you put your foot out. That's the how. <laughs> the question is, why? Why did you wake up this morning? Why? Why did you get up? I know what you did, and I see how you did it. The question is why? Do you know that every single day, wherever you go, not just on the weekend, not just on our sanctified times, do you know that for the child of God, there is no separation between secular and sacred? You do know that. Everything we touch is sacred. Now, notice I didn't say religious. The mandate of man is to run the planet. Do you know, do you know something very interesting? Do you know when you go to the end of the book of Revelations, do you know that it says the throne of God and the tabernacle are going to shift? Guess where it's going to come from and guess where it's going to? From... because you think it's just me. <laughs> it's going to shift from heaven to earth. Heaven to earth. Why? Because that was God's original intent. I know, I know we're all waiting to go to heaven. You ever think you're not staying there? And everybody went silent. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Because we read oftentimes scripture through the lenses of our genre of Christianity. And when we read through the lenses of our genre, we have blind spots. It doesn't allow us to see what it's actually saying or craft a version of what it's saying that suits our genre. It's very interesting. Look at the person next to you and say, oh my gosh, you are a powerful being. No, it's okay. It's tell them. Come on, talk to them. Tell them. You're a powerful being. <laughs> Made in the image and likeness of God. You're a powerful being, but you're not God. But you have, you carry with you a lot of power. Let me tell you how powerful it is. Let me tell you how powerful it is. So Jesus resurrects from the dead, as we saw in the clip. He resurrects from the dead, and he gives a command. He says, now, all power. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. All power is given unto me, both in and, both where? And, how could that be? Well, he was the God-man. He came to correct something. And so he says, all power is given unto me, both in heaven and earth. And his very next words, now, go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Why is that important? It's important because the seed came to restore the nations. Can I tell you that the nations are made up of souls and systems? We go for the souls, but we work in the systems every day and hardly touch them. The earth was made to be run by men, so it required us to create systems to facilitate what God wanted in the earth. Those systems now, many of those systems have been dominated by darkness. Now, when Jesus returns, he will return expecting that he found us occupying until he comes. The scripture, occupy, till he comes. Do you know what occupy means? It's translated to do business. Do business until I return. What business? The family business. What is the family business? Oh, I'm a king. My children are princes. We run nations. <laughs> the 
Oh, oh you, thought, you thought like I did, coming together like this on the weekend was the greatest expression of the glory of God in our lives when he's waiting for you to take the light, not here. What happens with us many times is that everybody wants to shine on the weekend when we come together like this. And then everybody gets blinded because it's so bright in here. <laughs> and when you're shining where the light is and gets so bright, you know what we end up doing? We start fighting to see who's got the brightest light. Because we think our greatest spiritual significance is what we do on the weekend. When the only reason darkness still prevails in areas where you live in every day is because the light got dim. And we said, oh, look at what Satan's doing in the world. And Satan's just, uh, and just, Satan's just, and Satan is just, and Satan is just destroying them. And he's just, Lord, hurry up and come and take us out of here because, because he's not coming back for a broken church. He's coming back for a victorious church. Hello? <laughs> he's coming back for a church that is running on all, not four, we have eight cylinders. We're going to be running on all eight cylinders, and there will be nations that have rejected him. But the Bible says it like this in Matthew chapter 23, I believe. He says, there are going to be sheep nations and goat nations. There are going to be those nations who were so impacted by the gospel that they did not hinder the flow of the gospel. That there are going to be some nations that don't accept the gospel at all. The question is, what is your nation going to do? Can I share something with you, saints of God, here in the island of Bermuda, who gather together at Cedar Bridge every weekend? Your assignment is the nation. Not just here. Your assignment is the nation. This is the place where you get built. Because when Jesus came, he came to establish his kingdom. After Jesus was tempted, the Bible says, after it was finished, he came to Galilee. And the Bible says, from that day on, from that moment on, Jesus only had one message. He didn't have two. Only one. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Now, he says in Luke chapter 4, verse 43, when they try to get him to stay in a city, he said, I must preach the kingdom to other cities, for this is the reason that I was sent. This is the purpose for why I was sent. I came to restore what God did in the garden when he created man and gave him dominion. Man lost that dominion because of his disobedience and how great was the fall because man is the apex of God's creation where the material world is concerned and when man fell, all of creation became subdued to futility because of man's fall. Man carries the say-so of what happens on earth so when he is connected to God, it's vitally important because the connection with God helps him to manage what God has given him. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? So when Jesus comes, he says, now, repent. You know what repent means? is the word metanoia, which means change your frame of reference. Change your mind. Because right now, your present mindset cannot facilitate the bodaciousness of my kingdom. And you've got to shift your mindset to embrace the coming of the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. It's not just coming, it is here. And so it is the kingdom that is now and the kingdom that is not yet. It is now growing the kingdom of God in the hearts of men. And then it is looking forward to the time. The Bible says in Revelations, and the nations of those who were saved will walk in its light. Oh, boy. He said, I want, some I, want, I want some people to return to being like the disciples who turned their world upside down or right side up. And so he comes and he says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've got to preach the kingdom of God to other cities also for this reason was I sent. And then he says in John chapter 20, he says, and as the Father has sent me, now I send you. So why did he send Jesus? To declare the kingdom of God, God's sovereign rule. His sovereignty, his sovereign rule, God is ruler over all. And that is why, and that is what gives man his authority in the earth. When you 
subject, come in subjection to the king. And here's the thing. How many of you know that the, the definition of a dictator is someone who has total control? It's a dictator. What is God? Okay, I won't mess with you. Okay. <laughs> He's a sovereign ruler. He's a loving ruler. See, we have had such bad examples of sovereignty that whenever we think of the word sovereignty, we think of it in a negative term. The original state of sovereignty was a loving king who shares his kingdom with his children. Can I give you a definition of who you are? Now you are the sons of God. It's a term that determines inheritance. You are the sons of God. Watch this, watch, watch this. We say it, but we don't consider it. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He didn't say we're Christ. We're joint heirs with Christ. In other words, in the system of, in the, system of the Jews, when, when the oldest son would carry the next, he would be the next in line for authority. All of the children under them would then come under the authority of that son as it's passed on from the father to the son. Well, God just did that in his system because he created it. He took his word, rubbed it in flesh, and said, today you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And the son now becomes the heir of God. And everyone who comes under the son becomes a joint heir. Oh, Lord have mercy. We are heirs of God. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something that you may have to just work through in a little bit. And then I'm going to finish. Do you know that this is so powerful that your second birth ought to dominate your first? Oh, boy. Paul, des uh, Paul describes his history, and I promise you we are finishing. Paul describes his history. Paul says, if anyone had a reason to boast... It would be me. And then he starts with his lineage. And he goes down and he says, born of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, I was a Pharisee. Oh, con concerning passion, I persecuted the church. I mean, I was in. Paul goes through all of that. And you'll read it. And then he goes on to say, but when I discovered Christ, everything that I thought made me me paled in comparison Watch this, to the truth. The truth was, my first birth better facilitate my second. Because when I stand before him, he's going to judge me based on my second birth, not the first. <laughs> I was born the son of Harold and Muriel. When I die, I will die a son of God. A child of God. Do you know how powerful that is? My sonship to Harold and Muriel will stop on the day I close this body down or this body shuts down in sleep. That sonship ends. Even though I'll be known as I'm known, but that legitimate sonship will cease. But the sonship that will continue is the status of the Son of God. Wow, well, look at the person next to you now and just tell them this. I didn't know you were all that. <laughs> I'm saying, we, listen, listen, saints of God. We oftentimes like to control our relationships with God. We were singing early as, we, as you were worshiping, and I was thinking of what would that really look like. And we were talking about how awesome he is. Like, what if he really showed up? I mean, like, oh, my gosh. Like, what if you read, I'm like, you know, unguarded, un... Remember when Isaiah went up and had a vision of him? Isaiah was like, he fell out. This just start, didn't start in Pentecostal churches. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Man, he went, he went up there, and he saw a vision of the Son of God, and it knocked him, son, uh, sorry, the vision of God, and it knocked him out. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And he began to say, there were multitudes of angels 
and they cry day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Oh my, the earth is filled with his glory. And you think you can squeeze that into a weekend experience. Oh no. We are called to live this out every day. His kingdom has come. His will is being done. So when we pray, the purpose of prayer, within all the context of prayer, the purpose of prayer is so that his kingdom will begin to be expressed more and more. His sovereign rule over the hearts of men. Let me throw this last one in and then we'll finish. Remember this. The Bible says if this gospel is hid, it is hid to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded. The hearts of men are ruled by spirits. It is that unseen realm, the one that is not way out there, the one that, the one that is just on the other side of what you see. And Paul says, listen, in this, in this warfare of the souls of men, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We don't, we don't really. Our wrestler is not against flesh and blood. Tell the person next to you, say, you really are not my enemy. <laughs> You may act up sometimes, but you're really not my enemy. We don't rest against flesh and blood. The minute you give all your energies to try to get people back or, or, to, or to revenge or whatever, you are wasting your energy because they are not the real enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But guess what? They are subject to the authority of sons. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? When you really discover, you and I really discover who we are in Christ, the enemy will hate the fact that your body woke up in the morning. <laughs> when you, listen, when you begin to really understand the purpose of your life, every principality that's dominating the area where you have to go in every day, it could be finance, it could be, no matter where it is, you show up and they're like, oh my God. Gosh, did Mary get up this morning? Oh, God. He said, go and disciple nations. Bring those nations under the influence of the kingdom of God. Do it before I come. When I come, I'm going to bring everything together. But get the nations ready for when I come. Get, the na get Bermuda ready for when he comes. Because he is coming. He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. Oh, he is coming. He is coming again. He is coming. Get Bermuda ready for his coming. Everybody's standing. I want to pray for you. I don't know how you normally do your endings, if there's anything specific, and I'll give the mic to your pastor in a minute. But I want to pray for you. Thank you for letting me come and hang out with you for a little bit this morning. I really do appreciate it. And can I tell you something? There are multi-levels to how the Spirit of God works. I was praying for you about two weeks ago. God woke me up on a Saturday morning. And you, you, you have to trust that what I'm telling you is what I believe God told me and what He shared with my heart in my heart and I woke up and, I said, and, and the thing that I heard in my heart was to tell Cornerstone they're in a new season I'm just telling you I didn't ask for it I woke up it woke me up and it began to fill my heart to tell them they're in a new season Tell them what oftentimes happens in seasons is that there's a rocking that takes place. He said, but if they hold fast, pretty soon they will rock steady. Oh, God. Here's a principle, Hebrews chapter 12. And the principle of when God oftentimes moves and he's coming to establish something, the Bible says, once more I shake. And he says, I shake and I shake. He said, but the reason that I shake is so that the only thing that is holding you up is that which is of the kingdom. You know why? He said, because you're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And oftentimes in life, individually, 
collectively, there's a shaking that takes place that almost goes to the core. All he's doing is adjusting us. He's adjusting us so that his kingdom can be the paramount focus in his house. Every church ought to be kingdom focused. We're the only organization that exists for non-members. <laughs> we're, we're trying to go out and get them into the kingdom of God. We have strong internal working, but it's so that the strength of our outward ministry is effective. And so tell your neighbor, say, you might get shaken every now and then. No, tell your neighbor. You got to tell your neighbor. Don't tell me. Just tell your neighbor. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. And I know you guys talk to each other here, so it's cool. <laughs> Just tell your neighbor, say, you will go through shakings every now and then. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, your life will shake every now and then. But tell them, say, it's just a recalibration to get off of you anything that is not kingdom focused so that you can focus your energies on the eternal purposes of God. You were saved to manifest the kingdom of God. You were saved and born again to model the eternal purposes of God. You were saved to bring the kingdom of God to bear on the arenas of man's existence. You were called for that purpose so that when you pray, oh my gosh, you're able to say, God, let your kingdom come in me. Let your will be done in me. Everywhere I go this week, let your kingdom turn on bright. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Not of a little neighborhood. We are the light of the entire world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father. And you'll be able to say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Father, we praise you and we bless you. And we glorify you. You are the King eternal. You are the sovereign God. Your kingdom reigns over all. Your kingdom birthed this earth. And then you fashioned it in such a way that your children would manage the family business of kingdom expansion. You put us on this earth to manage it so that we could fashion the earth and grow in the earth until the earth looks like your realm. Satan thought to disrupt that because he was angry at you. But I thank you that you sent Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, sent him into the earth to restore and to break every curse, to restore and break the power of sin so that your kingdom could come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We receive that into our hearts today at a new level. We receive that into our bosoms at a new level today. Father, I pray that not a person will leave this place not having a tidbit of revelation concerning your kingdom. And it will cause them to search, cause them to look, and cause them to seek the scriptures, cause them to have the, the illumination of the Holy Spirit to help us to understand that our mandate is to disciple nations. Our mandate is to declare the kingdom of God has come in preparation for our King that when he comes, he will bring all things together under the authority of the kingdom of God. And so we occupy until he comes in Jesus' name. I pray for Pastor Joe and I pray for Pastor Eversley. I pray for the leadership of this congregation. I pray today, Father, that just this moment of respite, because they've got so many things going on, but I pray that a fresh anointing will come upon their lives in Jesus' name. I'm just going to ask your pastors, Joe and Eversley, I know you're the key people. I'm going to ask you to come here and just join hands with each other. I just want to pray specially for you. If that'll be all right with you, just you and your, you guys stand together. Congregation, I ask you to stretch your hands toward them and just believe that God will grow them and that God will do in them as they lead you into a fruitful place. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for these men of God. Thank you for their lives. Thank you that they are not just men who step in, step in the gap, but they are men who take up the cause. Father, I pray that a fresh anointing will rest upon their lives. I pray that a fresh anointing, revelation will come. I pray the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ will come upon them in a greater measure. The eyes of their understanding being enlightened, that they will know what is the hope of your calling. And what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of your power toward us who believe? According to the working of your mighty power, that you worked in Christ 
when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities powers might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but in that which is to come and you put all things under his feet and then you caused us to sit with him in heavenly places I pray Father God that the anointing of a wise master builder will be upon the men of God and all of those in the leadership of this house. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we bless you and we praise you. And all of God's people said amen. Amen. God bless you. This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request, email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm.